together. So my talk today is, is on asking the right questions. And I don't know if you ever, ever heard this when you were growing up or when you were in any kind of school, but a teacher saying there are no stupid questions. Yet I could think of times when I was in school and students, maybe I might even have done this myself, I don't know, but we'd go out of our way to ask a really silly question just to get the teacher kind of flustered. So it may be that there are no stupid questions, but there is definitely an intention behind the questions that we are asking. The writer Ursula K. Le Guin said, there are no right answers to wrong questions, right? But there's our intention behind the question. So there are two kinds of questions we can ask. We can ask a question that keeps us stuck, or we can ask a question that moves us forward. See, questions are door openers. When we ask a question, we are inviting an answer. When we ask a question about something, we will start getting information about that something. So if we're asking a question that keeps us stuck, that kind of question is where we're, we're staying focused on the problem, where we're staying in victim consciousness, we're in victim mode when we ask the question. And that question might look like, why me? Why did this have to happen? Why isn't somebody doing something about this? Why does God let bad things happen? But if we're asking a why me question, we're gonna get answers to just show why do these bad things always happen? So we might hear things like, well, because your parents didn't parent you right, or you didn't go to college, or you lack talent, or you're not good enough, you can't take care of yourself, you can't do math right? Or, or God only likes this particular religion or this particular hair color. We will start getting answers that support that we're a victim. Okay. And this has to do with our brain's reticular activating system, our RAS. That's why when we ask questions, we get support for that question. Well, what kind of question did we just ask? Are we focusing on what's wrong? And are we asking a question about the problem, being in the problem, about our suffering in the problem. Okay, so there's the questions that keep us stuck and then there's the questions that move us forward. Because if a question is a door opener, if we ask a question to move us forward, we learn something new. And we move forward into a space where we now have a new opportunity to ask a new set of questions. We get new things to choose from every time we ask a question. For example, every week at the beginning of the week, I ask myself the question, what do I want to talk about on Sunday? What do I want to talk about next Sunday that would be helpful to me? Because I feel like if it's helpful to me, then it's probably helpful to other people too. So I ask that question every week, like Monday or Tuesday. So this week, earlier this week, I asked that question and I got my answer when I was reading um, our book for our book club, The Storm Before the Calm by Neil Donald Walsh. And he starts talking about asking the right questions. So I got inspired. I made a choice, which then led me to the next set of questions. <laughs> Namely like, well, what kind of questions are we gonna talk about? How is this gonna pan out? How am I gonna outline my talk? I got taken down a different road than if I had decided to talk about the book, The Four Agreements. Okay, so over this last week, as soon as I asked the question, I received instruction, talk about asking the right question. Then everywhere I turned, it was like I was getting information about questions. I would hear or read in a completely unrelated book, you've got to ask the right questions or you are asking the wrong questions. If I, had asked, if I had decided on the four agreements, my environment would have supported that and I would have heard about not making assumptions or doing your very best with what you've got. So I asked a question, I received some input, I made a choice, it created a new environment to choose from. 
All right, and that's what we do. Even when we ask a question and say we're asking about doing something new in our life and we get a no, even if we get a no, we still move forward into a new set of opportunities. Colonel Sanders, the founder of Kentucky Fried Chicken, KFC, he was rejected. He was told no 1,009 times. But see, every time he asked, hey, you want to buy my recipe from me, right? And he was told no, he moved forward into a new set of opportunities, even though he got a no. Right now, I have my dream job, but do you know how many no's I received before I got this job? How many no's? <laughs> like, I got so many no's, but every single no gave me momentum. Every single no gave me the new opportunity to ask, okay, what next? All right, there was a no. What next? Now what do I do? Now what should I try? Now how would this look? So questions are door openers. But see, if we don't even ask the question, we basically put ourselves in the position of having to sit around and wait for something to happen. And we're not meant to sit around and wait for things to happen. We're meant to be instructed, divinely directed, and take action, right? That's how we feel the best. We're not gonna feel good just sitting around waiting for things to happen. So we, we ask a question, and it might, if it's disempowering, we're not going to feel good. If it's a why me, why am I a victim, why do bad things always happen? We're not going to feel good, and our brain is going to keep showing us, well, this is, look at all these bad things. That's why you feel terrible. That's why you're a victim. But we ask an empowering question, and our, our brain is directing us in that way, too. Well, this is what you ought to try. This is what would be great. Okay, so we ask a question, and it's a door opener. But as you can see, it's the intention that's behind the question. It's not the question itself. It's the intention behind the question. I have been looking around on social media recently and there's, on spiritual groups, there's, there's this question that's being posed. What would it take for humanity to awaken? What would it take for humanity to awaken right now with all of this that is going on? Being in this, in this life that's suddenly so different from everything we have ever known. What would it take for humanity to awaken? These are some of the actual answers okay, that I've, I've been keeping track of on social media. These are the answers to that big question. What would it take for humanity to awaken? People need to wear a mask. Okay, that'll help people awaken, I guess, right? People need to stop being stupid. People need to be nicer to other people. People need to practice radical self-care. People need to be more compassionate. People need to stop hoarding. Now, I would say, especially with the radical self-love and the compassion, that's always like a wonderful thing to step into. But if we are saying people need to, our intention behind that, that implication is that we need things out there to change so life can go back to normal. We need things out there to change so then we can be happy. What this means is if we're saying people need to do these things, we're saying that the thing has to happen out there. We're not doing the inner work here. So that's, that's the difference then with this intention behind the question. We're blaming something out here for the reason something is not working. So this is really the difference between walking by faith or walking by sight. When we walk by faith, we're trusting that that works through us and we trust how God works out in our environment. We trust how God is everywhere present. But if we're walking by sight, that's when we're going to be blaming things outside of ourselves. So I found these four fundamental questions that Neil Donald Walsh talks about in The Storm Before the Calm. Four fundamental questions where we start before we start asking any other questions. First question, who am I? Second question, where am I? 
Why am I where I am? And what do I intend to do about that? Okay, so without really thinking about it, I could have answered these questions. Who am I? Well, I'm a wife, a mom, a daughter, a minister. Where am I? Well, in my home, in my music room, actually. Why am I where I am? Well, because there's a pandemic and I can't be at my church right now. What do I intend to do about that? Well, just give my talk from out here and wait for the pandemic to be done and go back to church, you know, one day. But when we answer that first question, who am I? And we're basing who we are on our environment, on what we do, our relationships with other people. Well, then that's changeable. But who we are at our core, who we are deep within us, who we are as, as we were created to be, that doesn't change. Now I could say, like, who am I? I I've changed then a lot over the years. Uh, when I was 19, I could say I was a dreamer and who didn't know what she wanted. When I was 22, I could say I was a budding rock star with a, a rock and roll boyfriend. So I was the girlfriend to a rock and roll boyfriend. Well, then he became my husband. So I could say, well, now I'm a wife and still a budding rock star. But when I got into holistic healing, I would have said, oh, I'm a healer. I'm a healer. What can we do about that for you? Let's get you all fixed up. When I had kids, I was a mom. That's what I was. I was a mom until I started homeschooling my kids. Then I was a homeschooling mom. Like now I could say I'm a minister, but I've been a, a girl who cleans motels, motel rooms for cabins up in Idlewild. I was a word processor and an administrative assistant. My hobbies, I could say, well, I'm a poet, a singer songwriter, a writer. Who am I? Then when all of those things change, I've spoken with people who've lost a spouse or gone through a divorce with people whose kids have grown up and left the nest. Um, people who have lost their job or had to start a whole brand new job or they retired and they didn't know who they were because their idea of who they were was tied up with what they did, what they contributed and who they interacted with. So who am I? When we really look at this question, this will unlock every question we will ever ask because it's not about our name. It's not about what we do. It's not about our relationships with other people. Who am I is about our identity in the cosmos. Who am I is about how we are a child of a divine creator. Who am I? We are a soul created with intention and purpose. Who am I? Who am I? So we're asking every question in our life from two different perspectives, either from the perspective of limitation and fear or from the perspective of who we are as a divine child of a loving creator. In the book of seven, uh, Second Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 7, the Apostle Paul writes, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and of good discipline. If we're choosing from fear, if we're asking a question from fear, from lack, from limitation, from blame, from hatred, we are not asking the question from the perspective of who we really are. We're asking that question from the perspective of the limitations we perceive in our environment. Now in the unity philosophy, if we feel anything other than peace, love, compassion, curiosity, calm, centeredness, we might look at if we are coming from that place of fear, which was not divinely given to us by our creator. Fear is something that we take on here in, our, in this human life. Okay, so if we are feeling anything other than peace, love, compassion, calm, curiosity, creativity, centeredness, we go back to the unity principles, specifically the first one. God is all things. God is all things. That is the first unity principle. God is 
all things because God is infinite and God is unlimited. And there is no obstacle that can block God. God is all things. Source is all things. Spirit is all things. Everything that's ever been, everything that is yet to be, everything that exists right now, and everything that is created through everything that exists right now. So the ideas, the inventions, the activities that come through the mind of humanity to create greater good in this world. This is a way of God continuing to express itself through all of its creations. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word is intention and activity. God created the cosmos with intention and then activity. Now we are also created in the image and likeness of God. We are here on this planet right now. That means that we are also part of this great all. We are also part of this. And because we are created in the image and likeness of our creator, we create also through our word, our intention and our activity. We create in our lives as the creator of the all creates in the cosmos. So who am I? I am an emanation of this source energy created with purpose and intention. I am the activity of God in this world. That's what I am. That's who I am. I am that. I am. So that leads us to the next question and the second question. Where am I? Now the question, where am I, it becomes not about a physical location. Okay, where am I? It changes from, well, I'm in this room, to where am I in the space of my thoughts and of my feelings and of my beliefs? How are we doing what we are doing right now? How are we showing up right now? How are we showing up in this world? That's where we are. That's where we are. Think about the last time that you felt really loving and happy and just connected with somebody. Where were you at that time? You were in love and in connection. Think about the last time you were frustrated and feeling very victimized. That's where you were in that moment. That was how you were showing up in that moment, in victimization, in frustration. I had my last big boo upheaval where I was very victimized, happened Friday at four o'clock. And I was um, trying to learn a new piece of technology. I was trying to take a beautiful MP3 song that my husband recorded for me and make a music video out of it. And all I wanted to do was take this MP3 and then put some graphics to it. And man, it was hard. I couldn't get my iMovie to, to work. It was had some old thing on there and I couldn't get rid of it. And then I started thinking about this other person and they just create little music videos right and left. And they, they handle all this technology and technology just loves them. And look what I created, Deanna. I created one more thing. I can create 45 of these a day because technology loves me. I started feeling envy. And I was like, man, why, do, why can they do everything so easy? <laughs> I felt envy and then I felt victimized. I felt like my environment was turning against me. I felt, I looked at my computer and I felt like iMovies was, was mean and my technology was mean and that it was just out to get me. Who was I in that moment? Who am I? Okay, I was a victim of technology. Where was I? I was in victim consciousness. I was in frustration. Why was I where I am? There's the third question. Why was I there? Because I was focusing on a problem. I was, I was stuck in the problem and my limitations and how technology hates me. That's where I was stuck. What did I intend to do about that? Well, at the time my, my thought was cry, throw a fit, drop my computer on the floor. But see, in the, when, we are, when we are messing around, when we are holding on to that spirit of fear, which God did not give us the spirit of fear, spirit of fear is anything that God did not give us, right? 
I was all in victim and blame and envy. I had to go back to who am I? Who am I really? Who am I? Take away this, this feeling of limitation. Take away the suffering. Take my computer away. Who am I? I'm the activity of spirit in this world. Created to create as my creator. So I, I too create through intention and activity. What's my intention? Well, it's to make a video. What's my activity? To go along with that intention. Make a video? Well, I don't have to know everything. That's it right there. I don't have to know everything. I just need to know when to ask for help. So where am I? I went to who am I, to where am I, and I was in calm. I was in curiosity, right? That led me to why am I where I am? Well, because now I'm centered in peace. I'm focused on being a creator in my life instead of a complainer in my life. What do I intend to do with that? I'm going to ask for help. I'm going to ask for help. What would it take to get some help creating a movie? with a song. And you know what? I asked my son and he was like, yeah, I'll do that for you, mom. No problem. <laughs> okay. So I went from being a complainer, a victim to, um, having help and support. See, we create this space by asking the empowering questions. Who am I? Who am I? Where am I? Why am I where I'm at? And what do I intend to do about that? Okay, so those are the empowering questions. And remember, questions are door openers. So we go back to thinking, or to the question, what would it take for humanity to awaken? Okay, if I am the center of activity in my own, of divine activity in my own life, if I am the activity of spirit in this world, what would it take for humanity to awaken right now? Well, it's not about what other people do, is it? Right? It's about us. It's about what we're doing. So now we can ask ourselves, well, what would I do to add to the experience of awakening? What can I do? Right? Because what is in the one is in the whole. What can I do? So now we can move to these questions that empower us. Questions that empower us, move us forward. So we go past who am I? Where am I? Why am I where I am? And what do I intend to do about that? So now we can ask our first, like one of my favorite first empowering questions is, what would I love? What would I love? This is a playful question. It gets us to, to just kind of open up to the possibilities. What would I love? Um, we don't think about our limitations and whether or not we're capable of doing it, right? When we just play it as a game. What would I love? Well, I would love to fly in the Millennium Falcon. Okay, what would I love? I would love a glass time machine and I would travel back to the, just before the pyramids were born, I would set my, my, my speed of time to watch an entire pyramid be built in like two hours. Okay, that's what I would do. I would just sit there in my glass pyramid and watch the pyramid get built. Because I'm curious. I'm curious. I want to know about that. So we play with it as a fun thing. What would I love? And then we can move into things closer to our own life. What would I love? Well, I would love to have a donkey sanctuary. I would love to be a beekeeper. And then that brought me to a question that I asked myself a few years ago. What would I love? Be a published author. I would love to do that. So what would I love? Then we take it to the next question. What would that look like? What would that look like? Okay, if I was a published author, ooh, I could see my book. I, I could see myself teaching seminars and workshops because I love teaching and I love the principles in this book. I love the ideas that I've been wanting to put onto paper so long. So what would that look like? Well, that would look like having so much fun with my book and getting to share it. Third question now for us. Well, what would it take? What would it take to do that? All right. What would it take? Well, first of all, I have to write my book. I spent years thinking about this great book and then watching Netflix. I spent years thinking about this great book and then playing computer games or going shopping or reading somebody else's book that they wrote. But when I asked myself this question, what would it take to do this thing that I would love? We open ourselves up to receiving divine 
instruction, a divine direction. What would it take to write the book? Well, I need to commit two hours a day to it. Instead of going on social media, instead of goofing around in the morning, my new rule was get my coffee and sit down and write for two hours. And I wrote the book. Then we asked the next question, well now what would it take? Okay, well now I need to hire an editor because I want a professional editor. And hire a professional artist to do the cover. I don't want the book to look self-published if I decide to self-publish, right? So we keep being guided forward to this next thing. Questions are door openers. We keep being told the next thing to do. When we ask a question, we receive the answer. Ask and you shall receive. Receive the answer and do something with the answer that you just received. Okay, so think about things you would love right now in your life. What would I love? What would I love? Would you love a new job? Okay, would you love to be in deeper relationships? Would you love to feel physically stronger and resilient? Would you love to write a book, a song, a poem? Would you love to learn to knit, to sew, to make masks? Because it's going to be big business for a couple months probably, right? You want to learn to play guitar? Would you love to be able to rebuild a carburetor? I don't know. Do they make carburetors? I don't know. Would you love to just like rebuild an old car from the 70s? What would you love? To plant a garden? Be a great supportive parent? Would you love to be a compassionate guide to your friends and to your family? What would you love? Then ask, what would that look like? What would that look like? Use your imagination. What would that look like in your life? And then ask the question, well, what would it take? What would it take for me to do this new thing? What would it take for me to, to learn to rebuild a 1974 Dodge Charger? Okay, what would it take? We are asking ourselves questions all the time. All the time. I bet you ask, a quite, I, I don't know, 10 questions a minute or an hour. You're asking questions all the time. All of us are, especially in times of adversity, especially when there are challenges in our lives, conditions that we didn't ask for. People who behave in ways contrary to how we think they should be behaving. We're asking questions all the time. But what is our intention behind that question? How are we asking that question? Are we asking it from a space of victimization? Okay, walking by sight and not by faith. Okay, why does this person have to do this? Why are they an idiot? Why can't they just do it this way? Okay, are we pointing our fingers at everything we're perceiving as wrong? Well, the implication there is we're not trusting how God is working in the rest of the world when we do that. Who am I? Who am I? That is where we start. Who am I? A divine child of a loving creator, created with intention and purpose. I am here exactly where I am supposed to be, to be the activity of spirit in this world. When we ask ourselves that question and remember, then we remember who and what we serve. We remember then what we do next matters. So by asking those questions, we move forward. We're expanding the good through us and into our lives. We're creating more good in our lives for the people that we love, the people that we care about, and the people that we don't know. We're not here just to feel good about ourselves and good about the stuff we do. Really, at this point, it's pretty clear that we are here to serve each other. We are here to bring the good in through ourselves for the good of all. We are in this together. We're in this together. We're meant to pray together, to play together, and create together. Because that is how we create heaven on earth. That is how we create heaven on earth. So until next time, remember, you are the divine activity of spirit in a body, in this world, in this place, right here, right now. You are the heart and the hands of God in this world. You are a soul designed with purpose and intention for growth and goodness. You were designed to do all of this stuff. You were designed for this. In everything you do, you are blessed. And so it is. Amen. Thank you.